because if we follow ACLS guidelines, should we just give her the DC shock in such scenario? Because See, the patient, yeah, yeah, it's a good point. Suppose if it's, if, suppose if it's an SVT, supraventricular tachycardia mm -hmm. with hypotension, then definitely you can do cardio version. Yes. This was a uh, sinus tachycardia. It was not an yes, SVT. Yes. It was not an SVT. I just wanted to ask, like in ACLS, they have not specified. They, like if you go through the tachyarrhythmia uh, uh, algorithm, say if, uh, if it is above 150, uh, if the patient is unstable, they will just directly send you Go for you cardio version. Yes. You can Even always if go it is sinus tachycardia, is you, it? You, you, can, you can go for cardio version also, definitely. You can go for yes. cardio version in this case, yes, yes definitely. Yes. You can cardio the patient. So that's what I was telling you. If you are thinking, thinking as a cardiac possibilities, yes. then you need to activate the cardiovascular pathway. Okay. Wherein cardio version, Okay. Like if the blood pressures are low, raise the blood pressure. If the pressures are high, yes. reduce the blood pressure, increase the contactivity, maintain the rate mm -hmm. and maintain the rhythm, normal okay. sinus rhythm. Okay. So these things are very, very important. At the end of the day, pressures of at least 60 is what is required to maintain MAP on the glomerular head to maintain at least 0.5 ml per kg per hour urine output. End of the day, we want to prevent multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. But what happens is, by if you optimize oxygenation by intubating the patient, decongest the lung, in this case, crepitations were there, so most likely it could be cardiac cause also. Need not be septic, cardiac cause also. So uh, you need to rule out the, and the five pentad, what are the five pentad of uh, serious cardiovascular disorders in complicated pregnancy? Critical MS, tight MS, tight aortic stenosis, Pulmonary hypertension, either primary or secondary, ejection fraction less than 40%, like cardiomyopathy, and Marfan syndrome with aortic root dilation more than 4.5 cm square. So these are the five conditions which are life-threatening. Most of the time, aortic stenosis, pulmonary stenosis, pulmonary hypertension, like Eisenbangers and other things, they have telltale signs of breathlessness, tachycardia, but cardiomyopathy can be sometimes silent killer. They just be insidious, just they'll have only tachycardia. Subtle sign, so insidious onset of breathlessness. So you need to have an eye on, the, on those things also. So please be seated. Yes, thank you. Yeah, we'll go to the next video. So, so septic shock, cardiogenic shock, <laughs> anaphylactic shock is to an extent what we have covered. Uh, let us see what is stored in the next scenario. So. Yeah. Which I wanted to, for benefit of the audience and me, you talk of vasopressors because basically the problem is vasodilation, particularly in septic shock. So in that case, isn't phenylephrine hydrochloride the best agent? Because it doesn't produce tachycardia and it is a pure vasoconstrictor. See, the thing is, phenylephrine is a short-acting agent, but you can give it as an infusion. It can cause, reduce the heart rate also. But... Uh, Noradrenaline is a drug of choice because the potency of increasing SVR is the best with noradrenaline. Yes. It's the best. So vasopressor of choice, first choice is noradrenaline. If it is cardiogenic shock, if the pressures are still low, you can go for adrenaline yes. plus or minus dobutamine. Or dobutamine plus or minus adrenaline depending on the pressures. If it is septic shock, first drug of choice, noradrenaline. Second drug of choice, vasopressin. Third is adrenaline plus or minus dobutamine. If it's anaphylactic shock, adrenaline, the first drug of choice, plus noradrenaline to maintain the blood pressure. So, and plus hydrocortisone nibble. So, basically, it's just speaking of plus or minus, first, second, third, the it different, it varies uh, depending on the type, type of shock you're dealing with. But if you know nothing, noradrenaline, Adrenaline, you just put it and then uh, you can subsequently uh, titrate and take it further. Okay? So, so I am. Yeah. That is, uh, we start ABC. So, A first. So, airway protection is the first thing. If we all keep video laryngoscope in our emergency cart, that will definitely help whether the BMI is 38 or. It is mandatory. In fact, if you ask me, uh, video laryngoscope is become mandatory now. It's not that we are not intubating uh, 20 years back or 10 years back. It is just that 
the types of cases each one of you have seen have, are, are changing rapidly. The demography is changing rapidly. Previously, we were not seeing so many obese patients. Uh, but now, if patients are uh, uh, they are going for IVF with BMF 40 and 45 with the, for IVF treatment. We are seeing those things. Advanced mental age. So the complexity is increasing. And in this event of complexity, better to upgrade yourself. Have a good liberty running scope as a standby. And more importantly, supraglottic airway device. Second generation LMS should be there. It's not very expensive. Uh, 15 so to to fifteen hundred rupees. Uh, you have that device, so, and they're wonderful device. So, so uh, with thank, the, thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. There is See, no intratracheal route, including adrenaline. Including adrenaline, there is no intratracheal route because absorption is. Yes, twenty years ago, they told us or we read that intratracheal adrenaline, especially neonate and this thing, was helpful. But now, the absorption is very poor. The ACLS guidelines have come out. There is no role of intratracheal. Intraosseous, yes. Either over the. Uh, Yes, yes. But intraosh is also, if you ask me last 33 years, we have training, uh, but intraosh is only during the workshop, actual training. As Sir said rightly, put jugular, okay. most of the things is settled. But again, for that, uh, you need to have a person with jugular. So the last statement, with your permission, sir, I wanted to tell the audience, I am reminded of that. If you increase, if you double the height of the saline stand, the flow rate will be double. But if you double the diameter of cannula, the flow will be 16 times. So that is what NSCC for physics for NSCC taught us. Thank you. All so that's the importance of a large board cannula. So thank you, my obstetricians. Thank you, anesthesiologist, and thank you, Dr. Sunil. So apart from this medical skills or these are technical skill here, the non-technical skill one carry home message is be leader, try to be remain calm. Uh, second. And yes, of course, there are certain technical things in the selection of the drugs, selecting of the pathways. So uh, we are going for second scenario. And for second scenario, I'll call upon uh, uh, the different gynecologists and anesthesiologists. Uh, may I call uh, gynecologists from Bardoli or Vyara or uh, so Dr. Gautam Bhai or Dr. Urvi or Dr. Neha or senior doctor, sir? Yes. So anyone Come voluntarily fast. or otherwise I'll call upon by name. And Gautam Bhai. Come, come. And the anesthesiologist. Uh, Kuresha, madam. Yes. Badresh, Dr. Badresh Patel, you can please come in. And yes, you uh, have your nurse inside. So Dr. Gautam Bhai, you have your staff nurse inside. And... If anyone, if you need any Kina. help, you call upon them. Uh, uh, please, I know your name. Yes, it is. You, you come by this. So, that, Dr. That Kuresha, OT Dr. Gautam is there. from that. OT Black entry is there. Is your OT or any ICU or whatever you can say, labor room. Anesthetist. Yes, anesthetist, uh, Dr. Utpal. In um, uh, Dr. Asha Lata, because you have not uh, lead the thing, so maybe this is your second chance. Yes. Okay. So, ma'am, wait. One nurse and one obstetrician. That is there inside. Keep NSAD standby. Yeah. So, ma'am, you stand. Every, everybody will. <laughs> so, this is basically she is again a 27-year-old or uh, rather 32-year-old. Uh, I can project the scenario. Can we can we have the laptop on the screen? So, scenario two is fourth gravida, third para, previous three full term normal delivery, admitted with six centimeter dilatation and requesting epidural, had taken epidural during previous deliveries elsewhere. Again, I am repeating the scenario. Please know the scenario. This is fourth gravida, third para. Previous three, three. full-term normal delivery, admitted with six centimeter dilatation and requesting epidural because she already had taken epidural during previous deliveries. So now this is your case. बहुत pain हो रहा है, दुखावा हो रहा है, कुछ करिए आप.
पेन के लिए पहले भी मैं पेनलेस डिलीवरी हो चुकी है तो कुछ कमर के इंजेक्शन लगा के आप पेन कम कर सकते हो क्या मैम नहीं Here the leader is gynecologist. I mean, obstetrician, Dr. Gautam. Bhai, please take a lead. Yeah. Okay, okay. कुछ करिए फिर pain के लिए. Yeah, okay. बहुत दुख है छे. बहुत दुख है. हाँ. बहुत दुख रहा है. जो बिन तारी चौथी delivery छे अने वर्धा करता वधारे रस्तो थाई गयो छे. एट्ले हम डीलिवरी थी जैसे थोड़ा ऊँडा ऊँडा श्वास ले तारा दुखा ओछो थी जैसे सारू मैडम डीलिवर डीलिवर बहुत दुखे बहुत दुखे मैडम दुख तो Behave like as you really deal with it. So statement should be very clear. अच्छा चक्कर आ बहुत दुखाई से. Sixteen centimeters. Sixteen centimeters ना. बिन धीरे थी उंडा स्वास ले ने पुश कर. जोर कर एकदम सरस जोर कर बस एक बार एक बार हाँ वेरी गुड वेरी गुड दुखा वो नहीं हो तो अपन पुश कर 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 बेबी इज डिलीवर्ड मैडम चक्कर आवा लग गया बहुत चक्कर आवे मैडम सिस्टर सिस्टर बहुत ब्लीडिंग था इसे कॉल फॉर द हेल्प बेबी इन्चे, बीजी बोटी वेन ले लो। यस वेन इस टेकन। बेबी कैम चे मैन। बीजा वेन में थी ब्लड सैंपल ले लो। फास्ट फ्लुइड आपो। ओके। रोज में ब्लड सैंपल लो। ब्लड सैंपल टेकन। ब्लड सैंपल फोन करी दो। अने फटाफट वी रिक्वायर ब्लड। बेबी तो सारू चे ना मैडम। चालू करो। रोज में टेकन। मिजोप्रोस सबलिंग वाले कापी दो, ओके, मिजोप्रोस गिवन, ओ, चक्कर आवे, नथी सारू लागतू मने, कॉल एनेस्थेटिस प्लेयर्स, अने मॉनिटर मुको, एनेस्थेटिस प्लीज, व्हाइट बॉल कैनुला लेने हेल्प मांगी ने पाइंट पुश करवानी जरूर छे, टू टू पाइंट फास्ट, चालू करो, पाइंट स्टार्टेड let me evaluate patient ने OT में लाई ने वो जरा जोआ नहीं शुक्र के अंदर कहीं tears है के नहीं volume बहुत ऊँचू चल रहा है mind push करो चालू करो blood से blood से पर गई उसे blood मंगा भी उसे चार चार bottle के लिए नथी सारो लाख फटा फट Norad Lynch study. 11 gram percent. Norad given. Blood matte arrange karo matte kai do. Kai karo chakkar aap. Trauma na thi. So, aapan ne pehli paani kar cannula aapi do aapne mukhi da hi andar. So, I have keep the carbetosis cannula given. Already given. Chakkar aave madam. आराम की स्वास्थ्य लगाने से हमारी धीरे-धीरे ओछू थाई जैसे। PPS कैनुला मुक्की से में अने 300 प्रेशर रखे लूँछे अने now the blood flow धीरे-धीरे ओछू था तो चे it is a atomic PPH। Blood ready था। Blood आ भी गया। Please give to PCV fast। Push करी। Check करी लो। Blood check करी ना पाइंट। the beauty of this workshop is uh, not telling us in advance as to what we are going to mimic. Uh, so if not available, then group to group blood. 
we will discuss as to what was this and what should have been done. Blood is still uh, on the way. Fluid. 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 administered. Uh, we need to ask for another, if it is atonic and if it is not uh, uh, getting ready, we need to ask for two more PCV, four units of blood loss is about two and a half and six units of platelet. So, so ask for uh, the more two PCVs, yes, yes. also four units of FFP also with that. Six units of. So four units or six units? Four. Four, four units four of units. FFP. Two Paxels have been uh, given. Two have already come. Two yeah. more four and uh, four FFP and four FFPs. Six platelets. Six platelets. Now we will keep on checking the consciousness of the patient. We will be checking the contraction of the hemoglobin patient. Report ma. Hemoglobin pre-op pre-delivery hemoglobin was 9.8 grams. 9.8 grams. Pre-delivery. Pre-delivery. Mm -hmm. If it's not stopped, then you will like to open. You want to send an investigation now? We need the CBC, hmm. platelet count. PTV. Intervention is not going to be able to do it. Hemoglobin has come as 6.2 grams. We require more. more, 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 more if it is still actively bleeding, we have to intervene. Surgical, Surgical, Surgical intervention. Surgical intervention. Then I will have to induce the patient. <laughs> yes. So take the consent and go for the high risk post of ventilator on table arrest. madam. Kai karo. Nathi saru lagtu sahib. There is no trauma and it is a tonic. Shall I induce the patient? Patient ne consent apni che related. Nathi saru lagtu. High risk consent ane ICU care. Induce karu shu patient. Mane kai thase to nahi ne. Just take a high risk consent for the sugar. Mane bachai le jo sahe. Tamne unga hi jaise thodi var ma kahi khabar nahi pad. Okay. Ah high risk high risk suit hai. Three given. Three given. And now we are opening the abdomen. Intubate. Intubate ma suit. Sahe mane bachai le jo. Going for. Now we are we are going for. Open the reach of post delivery. Exploration. Okay. Not like that. I could learn nothing. Yeah. Exploration done. What do you want to do? Put on the ventilator. Patient is having flabby uterus. Patient is having flabby. So, four FFPs, uh, six LDPs have arrived. Yes. We'll start with the. Uh, we, if possible, we'll take one more cannula. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, we'll start with the cannula. If possible, we'll take one more cannula. So, we will have three cannulas and we'll start the blood product from the third. CVP, yes, we can take CVP as well. Obviously. Exploratory laparotomy done and uterus is very flat. Very flabby. You want to send in investigations? Yes. We have sent CBT, CBC, fibrinogen level, platelet fibrinogen count. Fibrinogen covers 80 milligrams. Fibrinogen is 80 milligrams. Fibrinogen is 80 milligrams. Doctor. So we. It is cryo precipitated. BP and ETCO2 is coming. Yeah. It will come up. Yeah. 
Fibrinogen is 80 milligrams. We will also require uh, cryoprecipitate. And uh, we'll, uh, if it is not coming back, we'll ask for another four pints of blood, four pints of FFP, and six pints of platelets. So you okay. have given total four FFPs, yes, six RDPs, yes, and four pack cells. Yes. How much you want? For uh, another, another same another set, another four same FF, uh, PCV, four FFP, and six. Platelets. It's going to take some time. There is no yes. cross matching sample. Can you give one more cross matching sample, please? Yes. 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 Cross test taken. Yes. Given to the sister. Femoral methyl. Yeah. So meanwhile, patient meanwhile is we can increase the pressure. Blood loss is blood loss is four and a half liters. Pressures are still low. Vasopressors we we can increase noradrenaline if if uh, not then we can add an adrenaline also. Doctor anesthesiologist, you, you start not doing. In investigation, you want to send. Uh, ABG also we. PH is 7.0. We'll give is seven. 100 ml of bicarb. Lactate is 7. Bicarb is 6 yes. millimoles. Correction of bicarb. 100 ml state and 100 ml in pint. How much agent is giving? Patient is aware? Obstruction, doctor, how is uterus now? Have you explored? So, hysterectomy, Karmash? Yes. Proceeding with hysterectomy. Because uh, bleeding is okay. persistent, so we will go for hysterectomy, obstetric hysterectomy. Okay, so planning so, for hysterectomy. Okay. Have you given any compression anywhere no, if the uterus uh, is bleeding so much? So, apart from the anesthesiologist of food. Uh, what? Manual compression. Yes. Aortic compression. For PPH. Yes, yes. Hypo. Yes, hypertension. yes. They, uh, they can manage. They yes. <laughs> the patient so, is more or less improving. Okay. Another uh, Paxils have come. Four Paxils have been administered. What do you want to do now? We will continue with the we'll trans continue uh, with the procedure, procedure. We'll complete and we will look abdomen. for hemostasis if it is at abdomen. Yes. With, uh, complete hemostasis and there is no bleeding. Little patient, uh, you want to put it in drains? Yes. 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 Drain monitoring. Green output. Output is just 30 ml last two hours. Anything else you want to give? Uh, Lysix? No, no, no. no. Mm, hypertension. Calcium. 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 Uh, calcium, 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 calcium. How much calcium? Uh, 10 ml. Okay. Temperature goes to the temperature. Please, please, you can come out from your black box and have a seat on the stage. So, Dr. Gautam, Dr. Kuresha, uh, Dr. Asha Lata, and. You can guess what is fifth T, which they have done? No. Talk to the theatre. Shift the patient to theatre early rather than labour room. Very, very important because you have a good light, you have a good anesthetist at the head and the resuscitation is very effective. So they have shifted the patient to the theatre early. That was a good thing that you have done. They have immediately got two wide bore cannulas, which is another good thing that they have done. They have given one pint of fluid. What is one pint of fluid? What fluid? As I said, closed loop communication is very important. Okay, by default we know that uh, when I say one part of it is single acted only. Yes. But suppose if they give dextrose, you said one point of fluid. Suppose if your nurse or technician gives dextrose, are you comfortable with giving 5% dextrose? Uh, it will, uh, like once the dextrose in it gets uh, metabolized, it will become uh, hypotonic fluid. Hypotonic. So, uh, uh, so, what is uh, like the blood pressure of 60s and 70s, uh, I just wanted because most of the obstetricians are not very familiar with uh, fluids uh, in the shock. Uh, last case also I discussed about fluid management, this case I will discuss a little differently. Uh, why not 5% dextrose? You said dextrose get metabolized, what remains is fluid which is hypotonic, yes. Why not DNS? Suppose if somebody is giving DNS, if the technician gives DNS, are you comfortable with DNS? Yes. 
So DNS, so DNS, there is no harm in giving DNS, but I am not comfortable giving dextrose in BP of 60s, 70s, pH of 7.0. Why? This point has to go very clearly. Hello, sir, the 5 percent dextrose doesn't remain in circulation. It is sir, no, cr no crystalloid remains in circulation after 30 minutes. They either go through urine or they go into the third space, yes. It will, it will lead to hypokalemia and that is more important thing. See, more importantly, see how is dextrose metabolized? Recall your biochemistry knowledge. You, you, you remember EMP pathway, Emden mayor of pathway or anaerobic glycolysis. C6, H12O6 is metabolized to lactate and pyruvate. Okay? Glucose is metabolized to lactate and pyruvate. This lactate and pyruvate enters the Krebs cycle, which is oxygen dependent cycle. And it is metabolized to ATPs, carbon dioxide and water. Water is excreted through urine, CO2 is exhaled through the lung and ATP is utilized for cellular metabolism. So, in a state of shock, there is no tissue perfusion. There is no oxygen delivery, but you are still giving dextrose. That means you are giving more substrate for production of lactate and pyruvate, which are going to increase or worsen your intracellular acidosis. So, you are giving dextrose without correcting acidosis, it further worsens acidosis. So, there is no role of dextrose containing fluid in resuscitation. There is only one shock where you, there is a role of dextrose hypoglycemic shock and that too there is 10 percent or 25 percent dextrose. Otherwise, no other shock dextrose is necessary. Please remove dextrose from your directory, from your dictionary. Either 5 percent dextrose, the uh, uh, but even DNS should not be given. Okay. So, resuscitation, yes, ringer lactate. One pint of fluid, okay, give ringer lactate. The, when the pressures are low, sir said something very, very useful point. If you raise the hand, IV stand by double the flow velocity will uh, increase doubles, but if you put a wide bore, wide bore cannula, it increases 16 times, 16 times. So you are putting wide bore cannula, Dr. Kuresha had put wide bore cannulas very well, fluids are being given. Is there any other way by which we can increase the fluid administration? Here, we don't have a cap of 20 ml per kg, 30 ml per kg. We need to give fluid to maintain MAP of 60 still we get blood and blood components. Have you three-way pressure infusion bag? See, thanks to again laparoscopy, every theater must be having pressure infusion bag. Please use pressure infusion bag and you can give fluid resuscitation adequately, little rapidly. Because uh, in advanced setup, you have fluid rapid infusion set, which about cost about say, 8 lakhs rupees. But what happens if you are giving fluid rapidly? There, there is hemodilution. There is hemodilution. So what happens if there is hemodilution? Coagulopathy. But importantly, what happens if there is hemodilution? Or rather, when you are giving more of crystalloids. So what is the ambient temperature of theatre? 22. 20, 21. And most of the fluids are stored in Theater, or uh, uh, 20 degrees. So the moment you give about three or four bottles of ringer lactate, you are inducing cooling. You are causing hypothermia. And what happens to coagulation systems in hypothermia? It worsens. So hypothermia worsens coagulopathy. Excess fluid worsens coagulopathy. Hypothermia induces acidosis. Acidosis worsens coagulopathy. It's a vicious circle. Hypothermia, acidosis, coagulopathy, which you call as a lethal triad. So in the event of massive hemorrhage, major hemorrhage, prevention of lethal triad is a very, very important. How many of you use warm fluids regularly in your practice? Regularly, routine, elective, low risk caesarean section, use warm fluids. How many of you have refrigerators in your hospital? 100% sab You have OT, refrigerator in the OT, no? So do you have warming cabinet in your OT? 
So the, the cost of warming cabinet is same as little expensive than your refrigerator, but you can store at least 30, 40 bottles of fluid in that at 37 degrees Celsius. So please buy one warming cabinet for your hospital, especially if it's a surgical nursing home and you're doing at least one surgery a day. Uh, it is very essential so that all the bottles can be stored in that 37 degrees and you can give warm fluids. Why do you want to induce hypothermia when it is not warranted? So please, one of the important thing or crucial thing in management of hemorrhage is prevention of hypothermia. Do not induce hypothermia. Crystalloid resuscitation. So when you are giving crystalloid resuscitation, what are the endpoints of fluid resuscitation? You said one point, one point and blood be mangalia. Luckily, she has called blood very early. <laughs> which, which, which generally doesn't happen. Even in the best of setup, even in my hospital, uh, we have a blood bag, it takes 45 minutes for the blood to come from, by the, from the time of requisition. So, and that if you have reserved, if you have not reserved, it takes God knows how, how long. So till the blood arrives, how much fluid you can give and what should be the end point of fluid uh, resuscitation? So, pulse rate and blood pressure. Sorry, blood and plus pulse rate. So basically we follow a concept of permissive hypotension. Permissive hypotension. That means do not aim our blood pressure of 120 or 110. A palpable brachial pulse is good enough. That is a systolic BP of 90 is good enough. Output of 0.5 ml per kg per hour is good enough. So that means by giving overzealous fluid correction, you are not only causing hypothermia and dilation coagulopathy, but all the micro clots that are formed on the capillaries, they get dislodged and you see more bleeding. So uh, the tamponade, the micro clot tamponade effect is lost. So concept of permissive hypotension is what we follow. Do not give overzealous fluid. So, the blood has still not arrived, pressures are still low, patient is still bleeding. The Continue. Pines. So, plasma expanders, I wanted to, so whether you want to give plasma expanders in hemorrhagic shock? I said absolute no in uh, septic shock. Hemorrhagic shock, probably, probably. I won't be happy, but probably you can give up to 10 ml per kg or low molecular weight starch. But again, if there is underlying sepsis with hemorrhage, I will refrain from giving colloids. Okay? So the best colloid, if you ask me today, is blood and albumin. 20% albumin. Albumin is expensive. Hemaxyl and starch. Starch is preferred, but again, all this low molecular weight starch will cause long uh, term acute kidney injury, delayed acute kidney injury, because starch gets deposited in the renal tubules and they don't get metabolized. Okay? So role of colloid is very, very less because it interferes with grouping and cross-matching. It can cause acute kidney injury and it can induce coagulopathy also, excess of uh, colloids. So colloid probably only about 500 to 700 ml of colloid you can give, not more than that. But importantly, in this case, Madam is proactively raise a transfusion trigger and ask for blood and blood comment. We'll come to it a little later about blood and blood comment. But fluid is, do not allow hemoglobin to fall less than 6.5 grams or 7 grams. So you, you should initiate or ignite the transfusion trigger at around 7 grams itself. Okay? So why, why not you wait till 4 grams or 5 grams? So what is the critical HB in a hemorrhagic shock? How do you know the severity of shock? In this case, the vitals were seen, right? Pulse rate was 140, BP was 80. So do you, do you know something known as obstetric shock index? OSI? What is OSI? Pulse divided by systolic. Very simple. If it is more than 1.2, it indicates hemorrhage, massive hemorrhage. My requirement is massive. So, how long the mother with atonic PPH takes to deteriorate? How long, how much time is required for her to go into refractory shock? Let us say she, she diagnosed as atonic PPH. So, how long does the mother with atonic PPH 
for the mother to go or takes it to go to stage of atonicity or refractory shock. Hmm? Yeah, fully flabby, flabby uterus. Flabby, flabby uterus. Totally. So, the current recommendation now is always use a calibrated drape at delivery. I don't know whether the drapes have arrived in Gujarat to assess the loss. Assess the loss. Always use a calibrated drape because we need to quantify the blood loss. Assessment of blood loss is an old term because 40% of the time you may underassess the underestimate the blood loss. So quantification of blood loss is very important. So calibrated drape is very essential. But uh, if you look at the cardiac output of the percentage of cardiac output that goes to uterus, anybody? Any guess? How much cardiac output goes to uterus in a term gravid patient? 25 to 30%. About 800 ml to 1000 ml per minute of blood goes to uterus. Okay, that means five to seven minutes of atonic PPH. If I into 800 ml, almost four four and a half liters blood loss is there. Okay, so she has rightly given uterotonics. Uh, I, I, I was studying cardiac anesthesia. I have seen ruptured aortic aneurysm with massive hemorrhagic shock. I have seen several cases of atonic PPH. There is a huge difference between the two because in ruptured aortic aneurysm, you have a cardiac surgeon who just put a knife on the tummy, put a clamp on the aorta. You have a cardiac anesthetist who can put how many ever cannulas you want in the neck and lines. Uh, the swan gans and the CEP and art line and brachial line and femoral arterial line and you have uh, 2 lakh to 3 lakh lux domes of uh, light in the theatre, bright light. You have an in-house blood bank. The surgeon can put the patient on cardiopulmonary bypass if he cannot control the bleeding. And imagine atonic PPH is of the same magnitude, but you have one anesthetist who is not very competent to put a central line, who is struggling to put one more 18 gauge cannula, there is no blood bank. There is a single dome of light of 80,000 to 1 lakh uh, lux, but the magnitude of hemorrhage is the same. Importantly, emotionally, here you have a 25-year-old young lady who has just given birth to a child. There you have a patient who has already lived his life, enjoyed his life. Uh, Middle-year-old uh, of 60s or 70s or uh, probably 50s. So, contrasting situation, but the magnitude of hemorrhage is same. And you just have to see to believe it. So, the effort to save a mother should be very, very strong. And uh, I would say you have to be very multi-pronged. And you need to constitute a multidisciplinary team at, at a very early phase. In fact, in fact, she did call for help. But importantly, yes, the patient can get exsanguinated in five to seven minutes. Remember that. So, eutotonic agents is what they have described. So, again, you are the commander of the delivery suite. So, how do you assess the efficacy of eutrotonic agents? And what eutrotonic agents you want to give? First, we give the oxytocin in the pint. So, AMTSL is universally followed. Active management of third stage of labor is universally followed. Okay, 10 years of oxytocin at that time, at the time of crowning in a single ton intramuscularly and uh, 5 units uh, you can give uh, once the baby is out, uh, slow IV. Most of the time it takes care of. If it doesn't control, what do you do? And again we start the oxytocin in the pint, we give... My make doesn't. Okay. So again we start the oxytocin in pint as a continuous infusion, then we give uterine massage. Let us, say, massage. let us say this patient is a known case of uh, mitral stenosis with a mitral valve area of 1.2 centimeters. She is having PPH. Oh, then. <laughs> so how do you manage? See, you see the situation, no? You have a cardiac patient with ectonic PPH. So how do you titrate your oxytocin? Okay. We will give uterine massage also simultaneously. Yeah. And uh, naturally, we will not give, because she is a cardiac patient, we will not give methyls in methyl ergometry. But we can give uh, prostaglandin. 
to some extent. To Patient pulmonary artery patient. hypertension is 70 millimeters of mercury. No, then, then we will not give. So exactly, this confusion is there. I want to give, I don't want to give, this cannot be given, that can be given. So what I want to emphasize is, make a huddle. If this patient has PPH, my first drug of choice is this, dose is this. Second drug of choice, okay, pulmonary hypertension is there, but is the ongoing, ongoing hemorrhage, I will still err on giving misoprostol. Buccal misoprostol, rectal misoprostol. Third drug of choice is carboprostomethamine, intramuscularly. And the last and the least is uh, methylergometed. So if you have that thing charted out clearly, it, there is no ambiguity. Otherwise, as I told in the opening remarks, uh, she is an asthmatic, uh, she has hypertension, I can't give methargin. So those confusions should not prevail. Uh, we know that eutotonics are very essential in atonic PPH. At the same time, they can have the other side also. So what is good for the patient at that moment of time is what is important. So you can mitigate bronchial asthma uh, crisis by giving simultaneous nebulization of uh, solubitamol or you can give two puffs and you can take a history of asthma. Bachpan mein kabhi tha, kabhi niler liya nahi, kabhi kawar lete. That doesn't mean that uh, she is active asthmatic or she has active wheezing. Then, so you have to uh, judge the scenario and then take, take a call. So when you have a complex scenario, put down the things, what you want to give. So routinely, oxytocin, as I said, active, active management, third stage of labor, 10 units intramuscularly, 5 units, slowly over 5 minutes is what is given. Most of the time suffices. If not, generally what we do is 40 units of oxytocin in 40 ml of syringe pump and give 10 ml per hour. Not 40 units in 1 liter of ringle lactate, give 125 ml per hour or 500 ml. That's you are giving more volume and you are giving uh, rapidly, which may not be safe. So 40 units, 40 ml, give 5 to 10 units per hour as an infusion. Carbitocin. Carbitocin is actually Again, we are using. 1.3 mitral valve area. What, hmm. Do you want to give carbitocin? Oxytocin uh, in high doses uh, will lead to uh, uh, hypotension as well. So we usually avoid the, this kind of uh, thing. Uh, See, we one of the things is… using carbitocin only. Yeah. See, I, I'm talking about… I've made the scenario, scenario a little more complex. Not a simple atonic PPH. Sim atonic PPH with a mitral valve area of 1.3 or 1.2. The point which I want to emphasize is, point well taken, but I beg to differ, carbitocin is nothing but a synthetic oxytocin which does not require refrigeration and it is long acting. But the cardiovascular side effects are same, same as oxytocin. Same. And if I am giving carbitocin in a cardiac patient and it causes a new tachycardia, the action is going to be there for four hours. If it is oxytocin, I just switch it off and I migrate to something else. So, in cardiac patients, I won't advise, I won't advise, probably, I won't advise or recommend carbitocin as the first drug of choice. You'd still prefer oxytocin? In a cardiac if, patient. Okay. In a cardiac patient. I would still… Or, or why not then go back to old school and use a PGF to alpha and just That's what, use that instead of methadone at all? Because if you are giving long-acting agent, if you are giving long-acting agent, the SVR effect on the contractility effect, the tachycardia is going to be for a longer duration. Suppose if I am giving oxytocin infusion, I just switch it off, within seven minutes the half-life is over and I can at least reverse the uh, tachycardia because of oxytocin. Yes, sir. Yes, you are right. Because carbitocin is one drug that is so potent that it induces very strong uterine contraction. Yeah and thereby tremendously increasing cardiac input instantaneously. And that will further preload the right heart and thereby further will compromise hemodynamics of an already hemodynamically unstable or compromised Absolutely. patient. Absolutely. So carbitocin has to be, it's a wonderful drug, but has to be used very correctly. Otherwise, you're going to end up in soup. So, eutotonics. Again, I'll go back to the non-complex case, simple atonic PPH. 
uh, oxytocin, then you can give carbidis and also intramuscular intravenously. But importantly, somebody should chart what all you have given. If I have given carboprost, okay, I can give up to 2 milligrams per kg, I mean 2 milligrams every 15 minutes to 50 micrograms intramuscularly and somebody is making a chart. I don't wait up to 8 doses of oxytocin, I mean carbidocin, I mean uh, carboprost or methamine and then go to methyl argometrin. If there is no contraindication, give methargin early because it is one of the most potent eutrotonic agent. So methyl argometrin 0.2 milligrams intramuscularly every 30 minutes up to 3 doses, carboprost 250 micrograms intramuscularly every 15 minutes up to 8 doses, oxytocin infusion, misoprostol or multi prong therapy has to be given but simultaneously bimanual uterine massage, have a low threshold to do of appropriate obstetric intervention. Salvaging uterus versus salvaging life, that decision is very, very important. Uh, I still recall a patient uh, who was having amniotic fluid embolism, primary gravida with intrauterine fetal demise, abruption, IUFD, AFE, amniotic fluid embolism. And obstetrician, our colleague, uh, was tried her best to salvage the uterus, she crammed, uh, she ligated uterine, she devascularized the uterus, she ligated intraalia, she gave, took a B lynch. But in the process, took two and a half hours to attend all this, and at the end, we ended up giving almost 84 units of blood and blood compounds in 24 hours' time, and we had to do a hysterectomy to achieve uh, uh, the save, save the life. So, time to do peripartum hysterectomy is very crucial, very important, and I would like to take. An examining acid has some role. Tranexamic acid. Absolutely, I am coming to in that. Reducing the loss, that is one. One gram IV, but very slowly. And you need not repeat it, that is one. Second thing, decision of hysterectomy will depend upon your availability of the blood products around your centers. Sometimes, you know, to save life is more important than saving the uterus, as you have said very rightly. But blood may not be available that much, so you can't wait for longer. You can't wait that patient to go into the coagulation failure, dilution coagulopathy. So decision of hysterectomy should be taken at appropriate time judiciously. Very important. So yes, fluid, blood, eutotonics and I was coming to tenexamic acid. So once the mother starts bleeding, you can give 15 mg per kg tenexamic acid over a period of 15 minutes or 30 minutes as an infusion. And within, after 30 minutes, the patient still has bleeding, you can give one more dose. But beyond that, there is no role, there is no need to repeat tenexamic acid because antifibrinolytic pathway takes about 45 minutes to get activated from the time of blood loss. So first 30 minutes uh, you, is good enough uh, if the mother is not able to Stabilize within first 30 minutes, you can give tenexamic acid, you can repeat one more dose after about 35-40 uh, minutes and that's it, that's it. So fluid management, eutrotonic management, tenexamic acid, now coming to blood and blood components. So how many of you have massive transition protocol in place? See, we could see Madam said four, he said six. Uh, oh, and initially two, two, two pack cells versus four pack cells. So always, always have a massive transfusion protocol in place. That means Navsari has three blood banks. And how many nursing homes do you have? Hospitals? We are 50 gynecologists in our society. So, w w at least what, at least if you have uniformity amongst you all and have liaison with the blood bank, that means it, things will become very easy. What we have done, Fernandez Hospital, even today does not have a blood bank. But on an average, uh, we do one peripartum hysterectomy every five days uh, uh, because of the referral cases. So, what we have done is, in the event of blood loss, the requirement of blood will be 10s and 20s and 30s, not 1s and 2s and 3s. And it will be very difficult for the blood bank also to give. So we have a MOU with the blood bank that don't ask for donors, don't ask for money. It's a crisis situation. Because I asked for four pack cells, luckily the Pushkar was, uh, was getting whatever, what all he wanted. But patient will not have money to buy four pack cells. 
or six FAPs and RDPs, it costs at least nothing less than 20 30,000. When Paxel is even in uh, 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 Red Cross blood bank, it costs 1500 rupees, 1200 rupees. FAP almost 1000 rupees. So it costs. So what we have done is we have deposited 50,000 rupees in the blood bank, at least three blood banks with which we have money. And we ensure that at the time of crisis, they give us whatever we want. And next day, within 24 to 48 hours, we send at least 70 donors to the blood bank. Because some of the blood banks, they have a rule that unless you give donor, we don't give you blood. And those, uh, at the time of crisis, these things are, uh, uh, may not work out. So you need to have some sort of understanding, encourage donation, voluntary donation as much as possible. And uh, you can have, develop your own system of MOUs with the blood bank so that at the time of crisis, you get cryos, you get FFPs. Hopefully, Dr. Pusha was here. I made a point to uh, get the availability of cryoprecipitates also. But cryoprecipitates, I mean, are the requirement is the earliest in case of coagulopathy. Fibrinogen drops drastically in case of coagulopathy. And if the fibrinogen levels is, are less than 150, the clot formation does not happen properly. So we need to ensure a good microvascular hemostasis. The surgeon can do a wonderful job of doing peripartum hysterectomy, but there is a bleed, oozy. So microvascular hemostasis can be achieved by giving uh, fibrinogen or maintaining fibrinogen of more than 250 milligrams per deciliter in a pregnant patient. And this can happen if you give cryos. If you don't have cryos, at least have fibrinogen concentrates. Uh, at least affordability of the patient is good. Fibrinogen concentrate is available. Intas is the company, again, nil concentrate of interest. Uh, one gram costs about 13,000 rupees. If you have, that is the MRP. And I'm sure between the MRP and uh, this thing, you, there might be a sizable uh, uh, difference uh, what actually you get uh, to the hospital. So it may be about six, 7,000 rupees. And it is worth it. Just give three grams of fibrinogen concentrate and four pack cells should suffice. But by the time the blood comes, uh, you know the thawing time of FAPs and cryos? Thaw, thawing time is 25 to 30 minutes. And journey time from blood bank to your hospital is another 25, 30 minutes. So, and that one hour atonic PPH, you know how much blood is lost and how much coagulopathy and how much dilution happens. So, by giving fibrinogen concentrate early, you can prevent coagulopathy or worse, worsening of coagulopathy. You can minimize blood, uh, uh, overall blood transfusion needs. So, fibrinogen concentrates should be given FFPs, roughly about 15 ml per kg, uh, cryos, uh, one unit for every 10 kg of weight, and importantly, platelets to be given, maintain at least about 1 lakh and above in co coagulopathy. So, first, first two cycles, platelets are generally, they don't fall, unless the patient has pre-existing thrombocytopenia like help or any of those things, or otherwise platelets the general, the generally does not fall. But have a low threshold to do blood gases and send CBC every uh, hour during the ongoing hemorrhage, uh, PTA, PDT, if you have the facility. And as I said, do not forget the vacuum tenor. Simple, plain vacuum tenor uh, and clock it and you can know the clotting time and clot lysis time also. So uh, MTP1, MTP2, MTP3 is what we have. MTP1 is Massive Transition Protocol 1. When I say activate MTP, I just, our secretary rings up the blood bank MTP activated. So he'll issue MTP1, four packs for FAP straight away. Because most of the time the grouping is known. Fortunately, at least uh, anti cases, uh, blood grouping and timing is unknown. But sometimes if you have an ungrouped, unmatched patient and blood is not well, then O negative uh, two units uh, can be transferred in the event of crisis. Otherwise, four packs for FAPs are issued. MTP2 is 6 plus 6 plus 10. 6 pack cells, 6 FFPs and 10 cryos. And MTP3 is 6 plus 6 plus 10 plus 6 RDPs or 1 SDP. Okay. And if the blood loss continues, then you can just MTP3, 3 has to continue. And importantly, I would like to ask uh, Pushkar now. Let us say hemoglobin is controlled, she has put drains. How do you debrief? How do you sign up with this patient? Both of you can answer, madam. First of all, I'll assess the hemodynamic. Hemodynamically, she is stabilizing. She is stabilizing. Little loosey, she says. Yes. Drains about 30 ml of blood is coming still. 
What about the inotropes, whether they have… Minimal, moderate levels. Then I will try to uh, extubate the patient if uh, she is stabilized and will shift her through the ICU. Temperature was 34 degrees. Yes, sir. Other thing, nobody noticed the temperature. The smart technician who was there yes. has put a temperature probe by protocol. But you failed to recognize that hypothermia, okay? Yes. So, the worries decision extubate is one thing which you can take. Yes. But, uh, madam, what do you want to counsel the attendant? Like, uh, she has a peripartum hysterectomy, right? So, how many of you do subtotal hysterectomy? How many of you do total hysterectomy? See, placenta accreta, placenta previa, obviously total hysterectomy. No, ectonic PPS. I think subtotal hysterectomy should suffice. Madam, what is your protocol? Depend upon the emergency and depend upon the See, surgeon's I'll, speed. I will tell our experience, subtotal hysterectomy should not be done. Do a total hysterectomy. Because when the patient has a tonic PPI, you do subtotal hysterectomy. Uh, we have had uh, learning from our own experience was very hard. There were stump bleeds. And once you have stumbled, it is very difficult to access into the deep pelvis and very difficult to control. Then you put mushroom pack and pack the abdomen, all those things. So, total hysterectomy, at least, the, is the norm. Don't do subtotal hysterectomy. See. The time taken is a little longer. Yeah, agreed. But there is a new concept, and that is the bleeding from the lower segment. Bleeding from the upper segment and bleeding from the lower segment are totally different. Yes. The lower segment bleeding do not respond to our uterus. That yes. That is one. And many times it can happen that uterus, if you palpate uterus, uterus will be there, but lower segment will bulge. And the moment you compress, there will be gush of blood. So, if you open abdomen, if you are well experienced and confident of doing hysterectomy, unless it is a case of previous two, three cesarean section, or you, there is a possibility of injury to the bladder, uh, you can go for total hysterectomy. There are other indications. One is, say, colporexis, broad ligament hematoma, or even placenta accreta, placenta previa, and time is also important. Time also matters. Yeah. So, so what, what we've noticed is once… Mike, Mike. What we've noticed is once with the utra, once you proceed with the hysterectomy, once you've usually got all the vascular pedicles in check, usually patient starts stabilizing comparatively to what he was before. And then you can easily then proceed and take that little bit of extra time and proceed with a total hysterectomy. Again, I ask this question to both of you. You can keep the mic. This patient had a normal delivery and a tonic PPH and ended up with a laparotomy. So you want to go for transverse or midline incision? See. Yeah, I'm just, I'm uh, taking over, I'll just discuss agree, here our own agree. experience. See, nowadays, financial or midline incision, as far as the timing is concerned, I don't think there is a much difference because all surgeons are used to take this financial incision, financial oh. incision. The thing is, if you are going for interilac ligation, or if you are going for a, you need a big space, larger space. Say if you are managing colporexis, a large broad ligament hematoma. So in that case, vertical incision or a right paramedial incision might be of help. So it depends upon sometimes, you know, you know from where the blood is coming. A pre-operative sonography might help in deciding the broad ligament hematoma. So in that case, I would like to go for vertical incision. The dictum, the dictum when we follow is when the patient is very unstable and having acidotic pH and DIC, better go for midline. Uh, because once you go for phenestyl or a transition, if you want to go for internal -like ligation or any of those things, it becomes a little difficult actually, a little compromise space. So midline incision, uh, cosmetic again, salvaging uterus, cosmetic versus life-saving, all these things are very important because these are crucial decisions. Other important thing is return to theatre. How many of you have had re-expressions following uh, cesarean sections? Re-exploration. Re-exploration after cesarean section. Uh, you yeah. had. You have had. So, when you do a re-expression, it's a T. Like, if you take a horizontal, then you have a T. 
So, uh, no, we usually no, tell you open the penalty uh, scheme that you are already taking. We open the penalty scheme which you take it. Only if you think that you require more space, then you go ahead with the team. Why would you make a fresh team? Again, I would say, like, see, second time you call a surgeon because you are not comfortable with the hemostasis part and you want one more help. The general surgeon comes. We call another obstetrician, senior obstetrician. One more thing, sir. One more thing. <laughs> see, nowadays… They anyway, see, the point which I want to convey is, uh -huh. be comfortable what you are with, but yeah. what we have found from our own experience uh, is, uh, midline is more friendly, you have more space, and you can do more intervention. Importantly, all these things happen, all these problems happen in parturients who have underlying help AFLP. So even if you want to inspect liver and other things, it becomes easy if it's a midline incision. Uh, I would. Why not? What is the harm in going right with the incision that is already made? Inspect, and when you want to inspect further, that time make an incision. If there is something that causes obvious in front of you, then you don't need to do that. I would like to avoid that situation, what we said, re exploration. Yeah. Say, so, primary, on table, doing cesarean section. Don't do cesarean section very fast. Close the uterus, wait. If it is Sir, not contracting… you are senior. I am talking huh? about yeah. uh, a, a person who is less experienced. Okay. Uh, what we have seen is, uh, at least I don't say very frequently, but uh, a, a midline incision is much more friendlier and we have had at least about, I would say, 6 percent incidence of return to theatre. For whatever reason, multiple reasons, because they, are, they have not, because they, they are all uh, complex cases, medical complicating uh, this thing. And uh, when the surgeon comes, the madam will take a midline.